Hey, what's up you fucking degenerates? So you guys remember that Akai Dahlia drama I mentioned in my Sonic 93 video? Well, we're gonna dive into another little drama incident within the Sonic fanbase in the wonderful, beautiful, concrete cringe jungle known as DeviantArt. Now personally, I feel like this person was a little overshadowed when Akai Dahlia was becoming an infamous little Sonic tard, yet she still held a name for herself. She's mostly known for having incidents of being a homewrecker, drawing kill art of her ex-boyfriends, and pretty much scamming people for their fan art when she opened up some Halloween-themed contest. Who is this person I'm talking about, you may ask? Why, Truth Lily Gaia, of course! Now, I'm not going to cover any of the bullshit she's done in the past, nor am I going to cover any current shit that's happening with her. Mainly because I've only spoken to her one time and because there is an hour-long rant video about her that pretty much covers every little thing about her and her bullshit. There's also an update video about her that was titled, Woomy Me A Better Alibi. I'll link both the videos down in the description below, so go check them out. So now you might be wondering, Harsh, why the fuck are you even making a video about Truth Lily Gaia when this whole shit was over and done with and everything's been covered, you weeaboo schlick fest? Well, the answer's pretty simple. I saw this one video that was titled Three Years Late to the Party, and it basically talked about a portion of the Gaia rant that had a guest speaker giving their criticism. My skeptic ass went back to the rant itself, and I definitely saw some things wrong with it. I give all credit to OC Tent Aya for inspiring me to make a video about this, and to be a lot less ashamed to be making videos about certain topics that aren't as relevant anymore. I remember getting bitched at a couple times in my Sonic 93 video, saying I was too late or whatever, and after seeing that video, I'm more confident to not really give much of a fuck of whether or not I keep track of the times or not. I don't care how late I am, so long as I give my two cents about it. Now, I'm going to do my best to not say the same points as Tandaya. For the most part, I'll probably only be either elaborating on her points a little bit more, or I'll add my own. I might also say a couple things she said, but I'll explain the similar points in a minute. So let's begin, shall we? Hello to all. I'm going to be talking to you all about a young deviant art artist by the name of Truth Gaia, or Kayana, or even Susan. Now, I am not going to be talking about her character. I'm going to be talking about her character in the first part of this. I'm not a very good critiquer as of yet, but I will try my hardest. The first thing I will talk about is the species. Why is every Sonic character now a hedgehog? Don't you think they're, well, kind of overrated? I mean, your Susan is a light sky blue hedgehog, just like Sonic, which you said yourself that that's why you hated Sonic, because he looks at Susan's breast. Really? Just really? I mean, sure, they are, but like, what makes you think that's going to stop people from making a Sonic OC that's a hedgehog? I think what you're forgetting here is that a hedgehog, for the most part, is a predominant species in the series. This including the comics and the cartoons that we are given over the years of Sonic's growth and popularity. People are either assuming that a hedgehog is a very common animal in the Sonic universe, or it's because they like that particular species. After all, as Tendaya said, we have three main characters, Sonic, Shadow, and Silver. And these characters are widely acknowledged in the entire community. Also, when people play any of the Sonic games such as Sonic Adventure 2, Sonic Unleashed, or Sonic and the Seven Rings as an example, you are literally playing as Sonic, the main character, who, you know, happens to be a hedgehog. What a twist! But in all seriousness, a hedgehog is a very predominant species in the Sonic universe. I mean, for fuck's sake, people make hedgehog characters all the time, and I don't think that's really something to fault Gaia for. It's like telling someone they can't make a human OC and should just start making monster characters for the monster fuckers on Tumblr. I'm going to assume that a lot of the fan base get their inspiration from Sonic himself, because he's a very likable, well-received main character who is an influential icon in the franchise. Not just in the Sonic franchise, but he's a poster boy for Sega as well. Even I made a hedgehog character that I have yet to give away. 
Her name is Marion, who is pretty much a summer hedgehog who loves to have fun in the sun and spends most of her time in beach areas. She likes to surf. I really don't see how hedgehog characters being overrated helps in your critique. That's like a writer who has developed their story for years, asks someone to give them critiques so they can improve their story and characters more, and instead they have someone telling them, Hey, uh, is that the main focus of your story? Aren't forbidden love stories kind of overrated? You can't just say something that could potentially tear someone down after they've built themselves up from working hard on a project. Now, I'm not saying that Susan was a character that was built with thought because, let's be real, her character sheet is fucking atrocious. It really needed work. But what I'm trying to say is, it's okay to ask questions. In fact, asking questions is very important when you're giving critique to someone, especially when they asked for it. However, there's a limitation when it comes to using one of the five W's, that being the word why. Sometimes some whys can come off as being a dickhead, and some can come off as learning and giving some insight on a character. Now I understand what you were trying to do here, but your little comment at the end with asking if hedgehog characters are a bit overrated made your question for insight fall flat. While yes, the five W's and one H are important to ask when critiquing someone, using the word why is something you should be mindful and tread carefully with. Why not make her a different species? Why not a dog or a cat? I'm just saying that maybe trying a different species in an animal of your, for your main character would be different because a hedgehog has been used so many times that people are sick of seeing it being used in the Sonic fandom. You mean you're sick of seeing it? Cause you do realize that other people's opinions don't really validate your critique. Mostly because it sounds like you're going off on other people's opinions and not your own. Now, it's okay to bring up the audience's opinions in your critique. However, that's mostly for the sake of assumptions from what the character or story is portraying to them. An example of what I mean would be, Oh, that's an interesting idea! However, I think you should develop it a little more because your viewers might assume this instead of what it is that you are trying to achieve, and here is how I think you can pull it off. Now, that is honestly a much more valuable and understanding critique. Also, like, how is making her character a dog or a cat going to make any difference? Aren't cats and dogs kind of overrated too. I think what you're forgetting is that anybody could use almost any species and it'd still be considered overrated or overused because plenty of other people have already done it before. Hell, my fucking wolf OC, Eva, is an overused species and at least I'm admitting to that. So honestly, this defaults your argument even further when you ask, aren't hedgehogs kind of overrated? Having someone change the species in a character is another way to fail in giving someone critique. Here's the thing, when you're asking someone why they didn't do this instead of this, then you're not giving a valid critique. You're mostly just saying what you want in someone else's character and not being helpful in the slightest. It makes you sound... presumptuous. To be honest, if you really want a character done in a specific way, then why don't you create the character you're looking for yourself? Everyone has their ideals of what's a good character and what isn't a good character. And if you want to do a breakthrough with the character, then I got news for you, buddy. You're going to have to do all you can to do something different because nine times out of ten, an idea you come up with would have already been used by other people. Honestly, Susan is really no exception to being much like anyone else with a hedgehog character, yet it's like you want to fault for her for that, which isn't a good reason to dock points. The best advice I can give to you as a critiquer myself is that it's more important to understand what a person is trying to portray in their character, story, whatever it is, rather than just focus on how they designed their character, unless it's relevant to how the universe is set up. It's your job to see that so you can tell them what they can look over and improve on while also keeping the franchise and its common elements in mind. When you put all these traits of being a critiquer together, you are more than likely going to be successful in helping a person properly write a character or their story or even help them improve their artwork. 
When you give them reasonable key pointers and you're respecting what they are trying to convey in their character, no matter the species, then you understand the basics of what being a critiquer is all about. If you fail to do these things and you end up making the person feel like shit for even being a content creator as a result, then you are doing it wrong and you should probably not critique at all. You said so yourself that you're not a good critiquer and already it shows. The next thing I am going to talk about is the skin color of your character. As you can see from my previous sentence, the color of your character is a sky light blue. So your character is a sonic wannabe. Why? <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> my dude, there's a difference between sky blue and cobalt blue. A big fucking difference. <laughs> you have a very nice way of coloring your pictures. Why make your character the same as an official character of Sega? Don't you want to be unique as you tell everyone? Because to me, when I see your character's skin, all I can think about is a Sonic and Shadow fan child. Why is it that a species, hedgehog or not, sharing the same color as another character is such a big deal. You do know that characters don't have to be different colors of the fucking rainbow to be unique, right? That's like calling my wolf OC Eva a shadow wannabe because of her fur color despite the differing species. As for the Sonato fanchild thing, you do realize that Gaia made the OC when she was like a kid, right? You even showed off her old drawing of Susan later on in your segment. And I think what you're forgetting is that people can change the characters they have been attached to for years. Susan might have started off as just an empty husk, but over the years she's grown into a character of her own, much like how my avatar and main OC Alexis has grown from being a cringy Ed's World OC. For my next subject, I will be talking about is, oh god, the hair. Dear Lord, help me. Kayana, please listen to me and listen well. I really don't like your char your main character's hair. It's too uncreative. It reminds me of another character from a Sonic cartoon. I don't see how you saying you don't like a character's choice of hairstyle is going to make your critique valid. While yes, you are stating your opinions and suggestions into a critique, you also need to understand that you can't always add your opinions to certain points in your critique. Also saying that it's uncreative is kind of bullshit. Fucking hell, that hairstyle looks like it's fun to draw and could help me get out of my comfort zone a little. There's also the fact that like, no one has this hairstyle, whether in the Sonic community or any of the series. So I think it's pretty unique and creative. Also, showing an example like Breezy doesn't help your critique because their hairstyles contrast each other so much that it's kind of laughable. To me, how does your character fight? With that long, spiky of hair, is she a fighter? You would think that her hair would get in the way of the battle. Why not make her hair more medium sized or even straight or even short? Now, to be honest, this is actually a valid critique. Because, for the most part, in the Sonic universe, there is going to be plenty of fighting, action, and adventures. And having her hair a little shorter, probably to the length of Amy's hair or shoulder length, would have actually made much more sense. I love that one picture of your character's hair all short. It was still long, but- Did you just do an oxymoron? You can put it up in a ponytail, or even chopsticks. I believe it was a punk emo one? That one was really cute. Or even short hair, like that swimming one, because I feel like if she gets into a fight, or a battle, she would have a hard time with it because of that massive, long, spiky hair. Who, in all honesty, the hair is like shadows. My next topic on, on your character is going to be the body. I don't understand her body type. Her breasts are a size of double D's. Her waist is tiny like a porn star. I understand that you want your character to have the perfect body, but you need to look at, at a realistic point. No one has that figure. No one, and I get you use anime as your style, 
but you do know that even anime artists use realistic models for their art. If you want to be a manga slash comic artist, you need to understand the basics of human anatomy. Actually, I have a figure closely similar to that. While my waist isn't small to the point of looking like I removed a couple of my ribs, there are actually people who have a figure like Susan does. Whether plastic or natural, there are going to be people who have a figure like this. You'd be surprised. Also, bringing up the anime art style thing. While yes, anime artists practice on the anatomy, you also realize that there are stylized anime where they exaggerate certain assets of a character. Most of the time, it's in things like hentai, or anime that is incredibly heavy in fan service, or it's just how they're designed in general. I mean, take a look at Devilman. Gonda Guy's style is what makes the story work. Even when the breasts he draws on women look like giant round balloons instead of boobs that sag when they don't have a bra on. It's unrealistic, yet it still works. Much like how in something like Sonic, the anatomy is going to be unrealistic. I am sure that even Sega and Archie used base models in their comics. I mean, I'm sure they do, but they're not drawing anthropomorphic hedgehogs with human qualities. They're just drawing cartoon hedgehogs with arms and legs and they can apparently talk. I have seen your improvement of your character, Susan. I'm sorry, but she looks the same as she did when you first drew her. The only thing I see personally is that your coloring has improved. That is it. How in the fuck do you look at both this and this and then say that the only thing she has improved is her coloring? Now, I know about the whole tracing bullshit, with her tracing over some hentai artist known as Slugbox. However, what many are forgetting is that tracing can actually be a form of learning how to fucking draw. While yes, Gaia should not have taken the credit to begin with, tracing is still a form of learning. It's memorization. It's like writing the same word over and over again for a spelling test you had to do every Friday in elementary school. And to be honest, I think Gaia might have actually learned a thing or two about anatomy through tracing. The next topic I'm going to talk about is your character's relationship with Shadow and Silver. Now, I don't know much about Silver, because I never played the game Sonic 06. I believe that's what it was called, and I don't plan on playing it. Anyway, why does she have two men? One she is married to, and the other, I think she's, I think she just uses him as a toy on the side. If you love Shadow, that much, why not make him your your one and only? Because she's a self-insert, my guy. Shout out to me, who is a pretty hard cookie to crack, and not how you portray him. You make him drool over your character, even your self-insert, and makes him so creepily perverted that it's not even him anymore. To me, your character would have to work to even gain Shadow's trust and love. Where is all the fights that they get into? Or even watching TV together? Or even playing a game? Where is the where is even the development of them actually falling in love with each other? While yes, I understand that if you want to make an OCX kind of relationship work, you gotta do it in a way where it's tasteful to both you and your audience, especially if it fits the universe. I'm bringing up Devilman again because I promise you that this does give an example of what I'm talking about. So Alexis, right? Well in Devilman, her name is changed to Aiko for the sake of the setting, and her whole character revolves around her mental and emotional downward spiral. And much like Ryo, she is set up to almost never get the happy ending she so desires, which is to be with Ryo, who she is incredibly obsessed over to an unhealthy degree. The reason why I said almost is because in Devilman vs. 009, it is implied that Aiko and Ryo are married due to the ring on Aiko's finger, which could mean that she did get the happy ending she wanted, yet it is unknown of whether or not Ryo is mutually wearing a ring as well. While yes, this does involve the yandere trope, this also elaborates the idea that Ryo literally wants nothing to do with her. In fact, before she gets decapitated, he tells her that she is a mistake he shouldn't have made, 
especially when he even admits to her that he is in love with Akira and not her. There is even an alternate ending I came up with, where instead of Ryo being able to reach to his conclusion of losing Akira, he instead loses his own life before the realization that he is Satan. Aiko had decapitated him and kept his head locked away in a room that she goes into almost every night to further torture herself with the insatiable hunger to be with Ryo, and even goes so far as to consume certain parts of his body so she could feel one with him. And there's even a scene where she does feed Ryo some food and she chops up her own fingers to the point where he can barely tell, which enables her unhealthy obsession for him even more. Convincing herself in this little delusion of hers that Ryo is in love with her as well, he's just too shy or afraid to show it. While yes, this is somewhat of the influence of the demon that is currently possessing her known as Orochia, who has been in love with Satan since the dawn of time, a lot of the things she has mostly done was all her, where she consciously knows what she's doing, she just doesn't care. This is what I mean by done tastefully. This whole detail of Aiko and Ryo's relationship being graphic is due to the fact that the Devil Man story itself is graphic, and it holds some pretty sensitive topics that mostly revolves around manipulation and possession, much like how Rule of Rose tells the tragic story of an abusive relationship. When you make a pairing that revolves around a canon character in a specific series, it's okay to have a little fun with it and make them slightly out of character if it fits them in the narrative they are trying to convey. I am going to fault Gaia for the way she portrays her relationship with Shadow, because as you've said, Shadow is a tough cookie to crack, and I doubt he would act so lustful to a significant other if he were to be with someone. He would seem to be the type that would be protective, especially after the incident with Maria, but that's about it. Had Gaia thought about the relationship a little bit more, it would have actually worked, and maybe seeing Shadow acting lustful every now and then would have worked too. But again, we gotta keep in mind that she is a self-insert, and most of the things that Gaia pumps out are sexual fantasies or just fantasies in general. You don't have to make your character sexy or look seductive to get men to like her. All she has to be is herself. She does not have to be cuter, sexy, sweeter than any of the official Sega Archie comic characters. But she is being herself. I mean, she's kind of built to be sex appeal. So in a way, that is being herself. So this is my final saying in all this. Kayana, the character Susan is one you are overly protective about. It has to have a very long character sheet. For starters, the character is too overpowered, and your character has no flaws or weaknesses. I understand you want your character to be unique and different. That's okay, but all I see in your pictures are the same sad, emo, happy, cute, sexy situations. You always make her out to be the innocent as innocent can be. But didn't you say that she is an anti-hero slash independent woman with, with the powers of heaven and hell? Oh my god, creative. So creative. 10 out of 10. Best character creation. No, not really. <laughs> Heather, Heather, sweetheart, <laughs> let me tell you something that I think you're completely forgetting. <laughs> Almost every character in Sonic is overpowered. <laughs> yep, you heard me right. It's really not uncommon for a hero or a villain to be overpowered as they are in the franchise. I mean, take a look at Sonic. He literally has so many different forms that it's unbelievable. It's like after the whole Super Sonic shit, they wanted to go even further, like Dark Sonic, Dark Spine, or Hypersonic. Fucking hell, even almost everyone has fucking super forms, which suddenly makes them so much more powerful against the villains they are up against. 
I mean, if you look at the fan animation Nazo Unleashed, you'd honestly think that Nazo is so overpowered because of the fact that he can literally absorb energy through the Chaos Emeralds. His perfect Nazo form is literally on par with God. While yes, he was born from a Chaos Emerald, it doesn't really explain much further other than him just saying that he was born from one of the gems due to the negativity built up throughout the world. The dude was literally so overpowered that motherfucking Shattuck, a fusion between Sonic and Shadow, was formed. Literally fucking Super Shattuck and then Hyper Shattuck and... Oh my fucking god, this is hurting my head right now. What I'm trying to say is, it's actually pretty fucking normal for a character to be OP as fuck. It's like the same tropes with animes like Fairy Tale, Naruto, Sword Art Online, the list goes on. Especially with tropes like the power of heaven and hell. To be honest, I'd actually like to see a canon character that has either powers from heaven or hell. I think it'd be interesting. <gasps> Hold the fuck up, I just realized. Does that mean that when a hedgehog has the powers of hell, does that make them a hell hog? Cause, you know, hellhound, hell hog. Fucking hell, I need to stop thinking about this. Oh shit. And let's not forget, she is a princess. Oh god, just what we need. Another one! She's born from a flower in a magical kingdom who is, who is also immortal. So, Susan was born from a flower. Kinda sounds like Tangled. Which, didn't Rapunzel get her powers from a flower too? So you take different Disneys and different animes to make your characters look like a badass. That is fine, but when I look at your character sheet, I see nothing but you copying from a lot of your favorite animes and forcing them into your character. Now, to me, that's not being unique or different or even creative. That is just taking the image of what you like and making something uncreative. So, funny thing is, a long time ago, I gave my fairy tale OC, Stella, the same sort of backstory where she had died in a previous life and was brought back by Zareph through a flower. She started off as some sort of bud, and she got her green hair due to the fact that she literally came from the earth. However, the more I used Stella for roleplays, I kind of realized how dumb that was despite the setting in Fairy Tale, and I scrapped it and just later decided to give her the same sort of backstory as Natsu, where she had died in a previous life, was brought back by Zareph due to her parents literally begging him to bring her back, and she ends up waking up in a forest area thousands of years later, where she meets her foster dragon, Izella, an earth elemental dragon. At the time, she didn't remember her original name from way back when, so she took some inspiration from her foster dragon's name and started calling herself Stella. Now, as for the whole copying elements and forcing them onto a character, there's a difference between taking inspiration and just copying something. Now, could she have gotten her inspiration from Tangled? Looking at her character sheet, most likely. But at least she's trying to be original with that trope and making it something different. It is very normal for people to take inspiration from something and then try to twist it to make it their own thing. While yes, you shouldn't be forcing all kinds of things onto your character, it's also important to note that this is an important stage of a character in its development. All OC start off as Mary or Gary Stews. We all have our characters start off somewhere, and the more we look into our character and develop it, the more we realize that some things just don't work out and we just scrap the ideas for another character. It's how the process of character development works. Also, I would like to bring up that your character is, and I can't stress this enough, is a sex appeal kind of woman. When I look at your pictures, my eyes don't go to this full picture. It goes straight for that, for that ass and then boobies. That's the point though. Just as you said, she's built for sex appeal. And to be honest, that's not a bad thing to do. 
It's not uncommon for a character to be sexy, and while I do agree that there should be a limit to such, there is also the idea that if it's what you're trying to portray, then go for it. I'm going to bring up Aiko again, cause it will give an example. So Aiko has many different adaptations when it comes to the series of Devilman, and she is mostly sexualized in the recent adaptation of Devilman Crybaby, where she literally lets her breasts practically hang out from her shirt, has torn up her skirt to the point where you can literally see her panties in whatever angle, and even tore up her stockings and started wearing accessories to be more sexy. She even states that she thinks her breasts are her best assets, and throughout the story, she shows them off with pride and confidence. When it comes to Susan, her being written as sex appeal is really nothing new and something that shouldn't even be shocking. I mean, to be honest, Akai Dahlia does it much worse than Susan, because at least Susan is doing it in a way where it seems she's mostly inspired by hentai images and more. Meanwhile, Akai Dahlia has this weird habit of drawing rape. To be honest, I think having Susan showing off her thong and looking like a sexual tease is a much better option than looking at a fan character being raped by Sonic the fucking horndog. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's just my opinion. I understand that female characters need somewhat to be sexy, and that is okay by me, but when someone overdoes it, it's when you take away all that seriousness of the story to make the character seem bland and unrealistic. And that is why I feel that your pictures are kind of getting dull and boring. It's the same thing. I read the character sheet from top to bottom and it says she is a fighter and knows magic. Okay, where's that kind of picture? Where are the pictures of her training, getting into battles or even going on adventures? All I see her doing is hiding behind your version of Shadow. She's not fighting her own battles. She's not an independent woman. You also said she hates being a princess. Well, when I see your character, she is always with Shadow or Silver. She's always acting, she's always crying, being sexy. She, she loves being the center of the attention. She contradicts herself. And what I mean by that is she has her character dressed in something revealing or sexy outfit. And when her character is called out for it, Susan still over defends about it. Well, it's mostly because you're critiquing on a character that is built to be a self-insert. Self-inserts contradict themselves a lot. Of course, Gaia could have just went back to her character's profile and did some editing, or at least used it for reference. But for the most part, she's just a self-insert made to satisfy her fantasies, and she probably also made that reference sheet so she'd have something to give to the artist she is commissioning, or to those who are thinking about drawing fan art for her. I mean, I have my character sheet for Alexis, and oftentimes I like making character sheets for my characters in case I make a commission or a request. There is also the idea that perhaps Gaia is trying to make Susan fit into the Sonic universe with all the tropes she has in mind. While yes, most of them don't work, at least she's trying to twist it in a way where it's somewhat her idea. But it's done in a poor way, I'm afraid. So, yeah, Susan really did needed some work. Keyword, did. Looking through Gaia's current Twitter page and Tumblr, I have a feeling that she went and abandoned Susan, which is something I never expected to happen, but I mean, eh, that's her decision. So with all of that, I will conclude this video by saying, thank you all so much for watching. If you liked this video, hit that like button. If you are interested in any of my content, hit that subscribe button and the little bell next to it so you can be notified of any videos the moment they are released. See you later!